Margaret Halsa, War Eagle, how you doing? War Eagle, good start. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, listen, where are you coming from today? Um, I'm in the Seattle area. Seattle, how long you live there? Oh gosh, I moved out here in 2010, so 12, 13 years, yeah. Wow, it's been a while now, hey? Yeah, it has, it has. <laughs> Now, most people don't know this about you, I guess, is like you're an Alabama girl. You grew up in Alabama? Yep. Born and raised, went to college, all of it. Where'd you grow up? I, I'm from Huntsville, Alabama, so north end of the state. North end. So I imagine a lot of people, look, look, I've recruited in Huntsville. A lot of people grow up Alabama fans. I'm talking like out the University of Alabama. Mm -hmm. So like, is that the way you grew up or not? I did actually. My mom went to Alabama and so did my sister. <laughs> okay. There we go. See, I knew it. And a lot of people in Huntsville, it's like Alabama, everything. So, yeah. Well, well, tell me this. How'd you get into swimming early on? Um, so I started off with summer league. So summer league is actually really, really big in Huntsville. And I have an older sister who's five years older than me. And I think like most families, you know, my mom threw me in the minivan because my sister was going to summer league swim practice. And so, you know, I just naturally did what she was going to do. So I started uh, summer league when I was five and uh, really liked it, was good at it. And then, you know, I started club swimming when I was seven um, and club swimming was literally sold to me as, hey, you can start practicing in like March or April. And then, you know, if you start training a little bit early, you're going to be really good for summer league. And I was like, this is the best plan ever. <laughs> um, so yeah, so they had a really cool like introductory program that was just for summer league kids to kind of get them in. And then that's how they hook them. <laughs> and then I, I did it. I fell for it. Yeah. Now, do you, I guess, look, knowing you, you have a natural affinity for the water. Like you're, you're talented. There's, there's no doubt about it. And, and you, you worked hard in the end as well. So like, <laughs> like when, did, when did the natural talent start to come out? When did people start to recognize you were good at swimming? Um, pretty early on. I'm also really tall. And so at an early age, I think the fact that I was twice as tall as people helped a lot. But I would say honestly, as early as seven and eight years old, um, I, I won our city league championship when I was seven. And, and people were telling my mom that like nobody does that at the bottom of the age group. And of course, my mom like had no idea. She's like, I don't know anything about swimming. Because um, at that point, we weren't really a swimming family. And so I would say pretty early. And then um, I don't know, once I started club swimming, I, I got my junior national cut at, I think, a, gosh, I forgot, I want to say 12. And then I ultimately got nationals at 13. So I started at a, at a pretty early age, but I did, you know, I did plateau. So like like most people that <laughs> ascend quickly, um, you have to level out at some point. So it's, it's, it's good and bad, I would say. So was there a lot of talk about you, I guess, as a youngster? I mean, being from Alabama, there's there's not a lot of swimming superstars coming out of Alabama. So at a young age, when you're getting national cuts and things like this, there must have been a little bit of hype about you at that age. There was. There was. Um, it was actually really neat because one of the Auburn coaches, Ralph Crocker, was uh, coaching in a GPAC Florida at the time, which was in our LSC. And later when I swam for him in Auburn, um, he talked about remembering seeing me as an athlete when I was like 11, 12 years old, because he was the, the, like the age group coach. Um, so it was pretty neat to, to have that, I guess, recognition. But, um, but yeah, I would say I was definitely a little bit recognized, maybe not on a national level, but at least on a regional level um, at my age. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's feel good too. Like at 13 to be going to nationals. I mean, that's a, that's a big deal. And then, that would have given you a lot of confidence as a young girl, right? It did. It did. Um, I was on the junior national team as well when I was 15. Mm -hmm. And that was really neat because I, I could be wrong. At least at the time, it was the most successful junior national team, I think, in history. Um, like Ian Crocker was on that team. Brendan Hansen, Bryce Hunt. Um Eric Vent. I mean, there were there were so many people that ultimately ended up becoming Olympians. Demaray Christensen, who swam with me in Auburn. So I met a lot of people on that junior national team that I either would swim with in college or ultimately swim with, you know, um, on an international level. So it was a really cool experience. We just named a couple of uh, really um, famous Auburn swimmers as well. So like you, you're on this junior national team. So I, I guess at some point 
being an Alabama fan and then being surrounded by Auburn coaches and Auburn swimmers, it starts to sway a different direction for you. <laughs> when did when did Auburn start to come into the picture fully for you? Um, well, so I would say, honestly, ironically, there's not a lot of amazing long course pools in the state. So the, the pool, the only two really good pools, honestly, were in Auburn and in Alabama. So I went to meet at both pools. Um, the Auburn pool is definitely nicer than the Alabama pool. Is, it was, the Alabama pool is OK, but the Auburn pool was really, really nice. So I started going to meets there, um, got introduced to the coaches, got to, to vaguely know who they are because you're not really allowed to talk to them. Um, but yeah, I, I would say as much as I, as much as I was aware of that, I actually didn't want to go to Auburn at first because I, I had this idea that I needed to go out of state. I should try something different. So I actually really wanted to go to Georgia. Um, and it wasn't until I was in high school um, and started going on my recruiting trips and David Marsh actually reached out to my club coach and, at, and wanted me to come. And my club coach literally sat me down and was like, okay, Margaret, like David Marsh wants you to come on a recruiting trip there. And I don't want him to get pissed off at me and never recruit any kid again. So you need to go on a trip. <laughs> Even if you don't want to go, you need to go and just make him happy so that I have other kids in the pipeline that someday can go there. And I was like, all right, that's, that's reasonable. So I actually went on an unofficial trip at first and then fell in love with it on my unofficial trip and then went back on an unofficial trip. Now, I heard you say recently where you were originally a butterfly and like Mary T was kind of uh, this, uh, you know, example for you, somebody that you looked up to, right? Yep. Yep. Um, Tell us about that. <laughs> butterfly was my first everything. So I, I actually made the junior team in the 200 butterfly. Um, yeah. So I, I always started off as a hundred swimmer. And then when the longer distance became available, I was always better at that. And Backstroke was kind of a discovery for me. Um, so when I was swimming growing up, my coach would always give us these stroke sets and like 10, 100 stroke. And, you know, the first five, I always had to do fly because that was my best stroke. And then the second five were choice. Well, I wasn't allowed to do freestyle. It had to be a stroke. And I'm a terrible breaststroker. So that wasn't an option. So I, I would always do backstroke because I'm like, who wants to do 10, 100 fly? So I trained a lot of backstroke, but I never thought of it as training for backstroke. I always thought about it as training to get out of fly. And so then literally I was at our Southeastern Championship, our LSC meet one year, and I had some open events. I hadn't done backstroke events in a while. And so I was like, all right, like I'll swim 100 and 200 back, you know, whatever. And 200 back, I swam, got junior nationals. I was like, oh, cool. And then the 100 back, I swam it. <laughs> and I got junior nationals in prelims. And then I got senior nationals in finals. And I was like, huh. I guess I'm okay at this. And so, um, yeah, so I think a lot of it was was the underwaters, to be fair. Um, that translated really easily. But I guess I had secretly been been training it. I just, I had never thought about it. So, yeah, so I kind of became a backstroker. Um, I was always a flyer. I actually was a flyer on all the relays at Auburn. Um, so I, mm. I still used to weigh them fly. Um, and I still, I, I, I was always like, at nationals, I would be like fifth or sixth. So I was never quite good enough to make like the A team. Um, but I, I still loved racing it and I, I would still do it. It just wasn't quite as good as my backstroke at the end. <laughs> so so the backstroke came on in high school and then developed, I guess, once you got to college. So, yeah. um, all right, well, well, tell me this then. What was the ultimate choice in Auburn? You said you fell in love with the campus, but like at, at some point you got to make a decision. Um, how difficult was it? How, what, what? What did the decision look like? Did you sit down with your parents and kind of write it out or whatever? Like, or did you just say, come in and say, I'm going to Auburn? What was it? Um, it was the team. And honestly, it was the coaches. So I went on my first unofficial trip and I, I was there on like a Sunday and a Monday. So it wasn't even like an optimal setting. Um, but I, I just, I really clicked with the team. I really liked the girls. Um, I really liked the vision that they had. I mean, they were, at that point, they had not won a national championship or anything like that. Um, I think the highest place they had had was like seventh or eighth or 10th or something like that. What, but, year, was that? what year were you looking at, at committing? So I was, this would have been fall of 2000. Okay. And right. so right. they got fourth that year after I committed, but in the fall, I because I signed in the fall, um, they, yeah, what, I don't remember what it was, but it was higher than fourth um because my freshman year was the first year that we won a national championship but they were already talking about it which i just thought was really really cool and they weren't talking about it like oh we have this goal that we hope we can do someday they were like no we're, we're gonna do this and we're 
recruiting the people to bring in the people that we need right now. And we want you to be a part of that. And I was like, wow, like that's, that makes me feel really special that you want me to be a part of this thing that you're talking about, like it's going to happen. Um, so that was really neat. And then I, I also just really loved the coaches. Like Dave Durden was an assistant at Auburn and Tim Bracken and obviously David Marsh and Ralph Crocker. And I, it was a kind of a combination of really liking the coaches, but also really connecting with the women on the team and, and liking the people that were there. Yeah. Who was in your uh, freshman class? Name some of the, the girls that were in it. Oh, so I had a big freshman class. So Kirsty Coventry, um, mm. Jenny Anderson, Alessandra Lawless. Kelly Jones, um, those are probably the the big ones. Rachel Quartz, who's a diver, um, yeah, but yeah, Kirsty's going to be the the big one that everybody knows. Yeah, and I guess that's the big one for you. Like you and Kirsty end up having this uh, career from the get go, where you're almost going head to head from the start, right? Yeah, yeah. It, well, it was really funny because they they didn't have any backstrokers, and so they were heavily recruiting backstrokers. So Kirsty, mm -hmm. myself, Ginny Anderson, like we were all backstrokers. So they were really like brought in a ton of backstrokers that first year. And then actually the year behind me, they brought in two more backstrokers, Jerry Moss and Aaron Vulcan. So it was, it was very backstroke centric there for a minute. Um, but yeah, Kirsty and I were actually sweet mates my freshman year. And then my junior year, we were roommates. And, uh, it was, it was honestly, it was just a really great relationship because we both swam the backstrokes, but we both had secondary things. So we would train together a lot. But then Kirsty was also an IMer, So she would break off and do IM stuff. I would break off and do fly stuff. So we were together a lot, but we also separated a lot. Um, but honestly, I think, I think the media always tried to play it up. Like it was this, this rivalry and we didn't like each other, but honestly we were friends, you know, and, and, and of course there was a rivalry, but the rivalry is when you're competing. And then outside of the pool, we were always friends. When did, uh, tell me this, a lot of teams right now are going to be trying to figure out how to win national championships, right? Like uh, the, the Virginia women are on a streak of a couple, you know, Cal and, Cal and Texas on the men's side go back and forward. So there's teams that are, that are thereabouts where you were coming in as a freshman. And they're trying to figure out how do we, how do we crack this thing? In terms of what you learned your freshman year on how to win a championship, what were some of the things that were just centerpiece to that championship team finally getting it done? Yeah, um, it's funny. Like the number one thing I can think of right now as you're asking that is I remember this must have been after SECs going into NCAAs, but I remember at one point David kind of sitting us down and he was like, you know, it's an attitude. Right. It's not just that you individually think it, but it's it's you portray this attitude. And he was like, you know, when you walk on the pool deck and you're wearing all the Auburn swag, you're in your warm ups, you got your backpack. And he was like, every single person on that pool deck is staring at you and they know that you're the competitor and they know that you're the person that's there to, to win the show. And whether at that point that was true or not we were like, we all bought into that. And we were like, yeah. So when we would walk on a pool deck, we were like, what's up? Like, I'm here and I own this place. And and all of us would do that. And, and we actually had a really small team that first year. It was only 11 of us. Mm. Um, but we had that attitude. And, and I think it's because we had talked about it so much throughout the year that this was our goal and that this was what we wanted to do. And we really, really believed in ourselves. But I think we also believed in each other because we understood that it wasn't something that any one person could do. Um, interestingly enough, so my freshman year, I was the second highest point scorer behind Maggie Bowen and, and Maggie scored the most points, but in the traditional fashion, I think she had like two first and a second. I scored a lot of points, but, but not in a way that you always think of. I had like two fourths and a fifth place. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes you don't think about the fact that fourth place, fifth place, like if you do it consistently, it adds mm -hmm. up. And, and, and Kirstie was the same way. I think she had like a third place, a fourth place, and a, something else like that, right? And so, you know, they they really emphasize that, like, it's not just about getting first place at the meet. Like, get into finals, right? Get into to, to consoles, like, preferably finals, but just score and score in everything. And so it, I think it was that, that confidence building that we kept talking throughout the year, but we also understood that it wasn't about one event. It wasn't about our best event. <laughs> we needed three events, and we needed the relays. And so I think we had that individual confidence, but that also came from knowing that we had a support system and that everybody was was carrying their own load. Like there was nobody of those 11 girls that didn't score points. And I don't think any of those 11 girls 
I think they all scored in more than one event, if I recall correctly. Yeah. Well, there's, there's the, the talking about it for sure. I think that's a huge key. But knowing your women's team and knowing uh, what you went through, I mean, you, ha you had PK, which uh, we can talk about PK and what he was doing to the team. P PK is the strength coach for anyone yep. that doesn't know. Um, you had Ralph, the AHOP, Ralph's House of Pain. So that was yep. there. There's probably a couple of other things that you guys were going through to prepare you to feel like when you walked on the pool deck, nobody could beat you. No, but you, you guys were untouchable. So there was this preparation phase, right, of what you went through. Describe <laughs> some of those things. Talk to us about PK. Talk to us about Ralph and what he was doing. Maybe some of the things that, that Kim instilled in you just as a unit to prepare you for battle. Yeah. And, and honestly, battle's a great, a great word because that's kind of how we looked at it. And I mean, so dry land right off the bat, um, Auburn had this this thing called circuit. And, and I had never heard the term before. And obviously, it's a term that people use regularly now. But, but we had the circuit. Um, and, and obviously, it was the same idea that, you know, you have a bunch of exercises, you you do them for short repetitions, and they're and they're very intense. But I think we took it to a whole nother level. And you know, sometimes I look back at it specifically what we did, and it, it wasn't that it was swimming specific. It was that it was team building. Because um, a lot of the exercises, it was just so over the top hard. Mm. But what it did was it, it 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 united us. And it was the men's and the women's team, which I think was really important. Because I personally never viewed us as a men's and women's team. I, I viewed us as Auburn. I, I looked at the men as equally my teammates to the women. Yes, at NCAAs, we split up. But actually, one of my favorite meets of the year was SECs because we were all together. So I think that, the, you know, the circuit experience, being in pain together and, and doing some of these ridiculous things is it made you tougher. And that was its purpose. And, and honestly, it worked because... Every time I stood on the blocks, like I would look around at the people and I was like, heck yeah, I'm tougher than these people. Like, what have these people done? You know, and and I always had that confidence that, you know, maybe I wasn't the most talented or, or maybe I didn't have X, Y, or Z, but there was never a point where I didn't doubt that I had done the work and that I had done more work than everybody else. So I, I think it, it served its purpose. And then the same thing with our hop. Um, I was a part-time member, so that was our distance group. And, and that was really scary for me because I, I'm a very solid middle distance swimmer. Um, I get really, really tired and I need a lot of rest. And so especially those first couple of years, I would go into these distance workouts and we would do like 13,000 yards in a practice. And Ralph, I mean, you knew it was going to be crazy when Ralph would get the, those really big whiteboards out and he'd start writing and he'd keep writing and then he'd go around to the back. And he'd keep writing and I would just be like, <gasps> and this is all one set, right? Like you're just like the whole front and back. And I, I just, I would get this like deer in headlights look sometimes. And, and Ralph was really good about recognizing that. And, and he would pull me aside sometimes and be like, okay, Margaret, like this is the part where I want you to punch it and I want you to go hard. And this part you can kind of float, just make the interval. Or sometimes he'd be like, you know, cut off a 50, you know, or do dolphin kick in your breaststroke if it's an IM because your breaststroke's so slow, you won't make the interval. But he would find ways for me to be able to make the set, but still get something out of it. And, and, and ultimately, that built my confidence so that someday I was able to do the, the thing correctly and do the whole thing. But, but I got really intimidated. And I think that all of that was about learning confidence and, and you know, have, <laughs> yeah, just being confident, I guess. What about in terms of uh, personal team identity as well? Like you, you're coming into a program where the men's team is very dominant. They've won national championships. They've got a lot of really uh, dominant men on their program, right? Like that strut yeah. around the deck and and uh, and think they're pretty good. Uh, I may have been one of those people at one stage, <laughs> but I'm um, like, but yeah, it, it's a very de dominant men's team. So how does the women find their own identity and 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 ease into this point of like? you know, we're going to be national champions as well. Um, so I think, I think honestly it was the perfect storm because the men had won in 97 and 99 and this was the fall of 2001. And so it, you know, it had been two years and the men were really hungry as well. And so I think we had a, a common goal to be honest. And, and the men didn't win that year, but they did win the next year in 2003. And I actually think the fact that like, they recognized that we could hold our own. Um, I, you know, I would say traditionally women are, are a little bit better at training. Um, and so a lot of times 
we were racing head to head with the guys, especially some of these distance women. Like, you know, I mean, she's younger than me, but I remember like Haley Pearsall, you know, she could just kill it in practice and Mm -hmm. she would race with a lot of these guys. And her and Eric Chanteau were dating at one point. And I remember the two of them going head to head. And and I think it was just sheer willpower that Eric was like, no, I'm not letting my girlfriend beat me in practice. <laughs> um, but, but we would race the guys. And I think that they respected that. And because they respected us, that that bonded us as a team. And then because we had this common goal, we we all held each other accountable. And, and actually going back to your first question, I, I actually think the number one thing, especially now as an adult looking back, um, we had dry season and and this was a self-imposed thing that the athletes did. So um, we would actually have no drinking, no partying, ideally not staying up late from pretty much end of Christmas training to the beginning of January, all the way through NCAAs. And the fact that that was self-imposed by the team and a bunch of college kids, right? When, when partying is kind of a thing, like I look back at that and I'm like, that's really impressive. And that shows how dedicated we were. And that shows how seriously we were taking this, that we were like, no, like we're going to focus on training and we're going to focus on, you know, doing the things that we perceive to be the right things to, to get our goals done. So I, I, you know, my freshman year, actually, um, some of the freshmen didn't quite understand that. And we went out one night and we didn't drink because we understood dry season to not be about drinking. But we didn't realize it also just meant like going to bed early. And when, and I remember the captains like pulling us aside like the next day because everybody knew everything and like sitting us all down. And, and, you know, it wasn't we weren't in trouble horrifically, but we were very sternly told like, no, 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 you're not allowed to go out. Like you need to be taking care of yourself. You need to be hydrated. You need to be going to bed like this is about bonding with your team and, and being responsible. And it was sort of that was the first time I was like, oh. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I think there were just a lot of really cool things that that people as a group did, but we but we definitely held each other accountable. So you guys went freshman year. What what about the other three years? What what was the results? So for the women when I was there, I was freshman, sophomore, junior year, and then my senior year we got second. And then for the men, they were sophomore, junior, senior year. Was there anything different in that senior year that you could kind of pinpoint? <laughs> got second um i think honestly we lost a little bit of confidence was what i saw was there were a lot of people that i think just for lack of a better word were starting to buckle under the pressure and, and really feel that pressure of we've done this three times and you know everybody's staring at us and 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 they started to see that as a negative um instead of as a positive and so i think they just let it get to them um versus just being proud of it and and using it as a reason to continue to go faster like i think we still performed well as a group and i and i I certainly don't think that it was a bad meet but i definitely think there were some people that just crumbled a little bit under the pressure and and also honestly georgia won that year like georgia just stepped up to the plate you know like it it was really interesting i think there was like a 10-year period where every ncaa championship on the women's side it was either auburn or it was georgia like so you know they had been second i think the whole time we were winning so i just think they wanted it more than we did yeah i was going to say that is like you know what's what's the difference between winning a championship and not and you talked about dealing with pressure right that that's key and then wanting it is is certainly another factor is there anything else that we can pinpoint that we could share for you know for people that are watching this that (laughs) put into their own, uh, you know, programs? I think at that point, honestly, it, it's, I, I think it's more mental because I, I I don't think you could say we weren't physically prepared, right? I'm sure we were just as physically prepared as Georgia was. So I think to some extent, when you get to that point, it, it really does come down to the mental. And, and sometimes people don't talk about the mental element of, of sports at all and how important that is. But yeah, I think a lot of times, winning and losing really does come down to just the mental side of it because everybody's training really, really hard. So it it would be hard to pinpoint that this person's more physically fit or this person has worked harder. So, yeah. Yeah. We individualize training in the pool. So why not individualize your nutrition? Erica Biney of Biney Wellness Building will help you and your swimmers get exactly what each athlete needs through genetic testing and personalized nutrition plans. So stop guessing what you should and shouldn't be putting into your body. 
athletes within a few weeks have noticed they're recovering faster because they're fueling their body with what they need and staying away from what their body hates. Erica understands swimming. She gets it. She's worked with over 20 Olympians, including the fastest man in the world, Caleb Dressel. Group discounts are available, so go to Biney Wellness Building and get in touch with Erica today. That's Biney, B-E-I-N-E, wellnessbuilding.net. Swim Angelfish. Swim Angelfish is an online certification program that strengthens your teaching curriculum to serve swimmers of all abilities. Swim Angelfish will prepare you and your instructors with the skills to teach swimmers with autism, physical disabilities, anxiety, sensory and motor conditions, and more. Learn to teach skills faster and with more comfort with Swim Angelfish. Apply for an only alpha pool product scholarship and receive up to 50% off your certification. Go to swimangelfish.com today to apply. One of the key things too for the teams that I remember and the way that we used to be coached was that, look, you had your primary events, but it was it was vital that you developed a third event, which could which might mean an event that you've never swum before, it might mean a stroke that you're not really proficient in. So it was like committing to something early on in the season to say, you know, in, in six months from now, this is going to be my third event, this is going to be my secondary stroke. I'm going to be scoring at NCAAs in this event, even though right now I'm probably not in the, in the top 50 in the country in it. You know, <laughs> six months from now, I'm going to be top 16. So that was kind of the mentality, right? It was. And, and actually, David Marsh did something that was really unique with that. So a lot of times you see schools and they just throw everybody in the 53 because they don't know what else to do. And, and honestly, like you're a 50 free seller, like you can't decide to do the 50 free. The 50 free picks you, right? Like I would love to be a 50 freestyler, but it's not going to happen. So one of the things David Marsh did was he put everybody in the 200 IM, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, sometimes guys would, would develop into backstrokers or butterflies or breaststrokers or whatever from that. Mm. But he just threw everybody in the 200 IM and, and then we would get to NCAAs and especially in the men's team. And we'd have like four guys in, in the finals of the 200 IM. Like it was ridiculous. Mm. Um, but I, I don't know if he did that just because he didn't think anybody else would would be in those events, which was true. Um, but I also, I honestly think it helped develop other things because like I said, like there were guys that became 100 flyers or 100 backstrokers out of that, but they had a little bit of that training and that base there. And then they were like, okay, my breaststroke is bad enough, but I can't do this, but I'm a, I'm a decent enough flyer or backstroker that I can maybe do that as a third event. So that yeah. was a little unique. Yeah. A lot of the time I'd have people comment to me like, where do you go to school? I Auburn, Alabama. Like I'm from, I'm from Sydney, Australia. So that, that, that was confusing to them. But then, but then also, you know, we would say we'd won so many national titles and this and that. They'd be like, what? Like in Auburn, Alabama, like what was it about Auburn that, that made it special, that made it, that gave us the ability to win national championships? Auburn special in general for a lot of reasons. I mean, Auburn is the epitome of a college town. And, and so you go there as a student and you're just in this bubble. Like it's not a big place. Like I think there's like 10,000 people that live there like not, you know, normally. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, it's a bigger school, but it's, you just live in this little bubble. And then I think that's really conducive to creating sports. And, and Auburn's good at a lot of sports. It's not just swimming. And, and I think that's part of the reason. Um, but also, I, I think it really was. It was the coaches that started, I think, the atmosphere and the culture. But then it was people buying into it. Because if people don't buy into it, it, it doesn't matter, right? Um, but it was setting a culture that, honestly, was probably started by by people that were there when you were there or people that were there before you. And then maybe you bought into it. But I know that was what I fell in love with on my recruiting trip, was I fell in love with the fact that, that the people on the team really – loved being there they, they they just loved auburn and they loved the team they they believed what the coaches were telling them and i, I don't know i just it it's hard to explain it it, it is really unique though but um but i do think kind of having that little bubble atmosphere helped and then the fact that we all thought kind of similarly for lack of a better word but we all kind of had the same goals and because people will talk about how do you balance, you know, your individual training like the Olympics with, you know, something like the NCAA system. And 
what's amazing about that is, is Auburn, we, we were not lacking in Olympians, right? I think in 2008, they said something like, like there was some crazy statistic. It was like, if Auburn was a country, we would have been like fifth in the medal count or something like that. Um, mm. So there were tons of Olympians from different countries, like all over the world, which was really, really neat. So we were performing at an at a elite level internationally, but we still were able to, you know, have that mindset and, and all come together. So I don't know. I guess I don't know exactly what it was, but I think having that mindset and that culture was was a lot of it. What about you? What about you personally? What brought out the best in you when when Margaret was um, swimming just un when you felt unstoppable? What, what were the conditions for you? Um, well, for Auburn, I would say specifically it was swimming for the team. Um, I, I loved having that team environment. Um, I actually loved summer league swimming when I was a kid. I swim summer league up till I was 17. And uh, my coach teased me that I went to Olympic trials and my summer league championships in the same summer in the summer of 2000. <laughs> um, but honestly, in my opinion, college swimming is, is summer league for adults. Like it's the grown up version of summer league. And, mm. and so I, I always really liked that team atmosphere. And the idea that the times don't matter and the scoring points and that you're swimming for somebody else. And as a result of that, people go really fast times. So the times worked themselves out. Um, but I, I don't know. I always felt like my team needed me to do this. And, and I actually remember one year at NCAA is like I didn't feel my best. And I think it was my junior year and I was swimming the 200 freestyle and I ended up winning it. But that was why. Like I stood up on the blocks and I was like, my team needs me to do this. Like period, end of story. Like, doesn't matter that I don't feel good. Doesn't matter the circumstances. This is what my team needs me to do. And I'm not going to let them down, period, end of story. I'm not going to let them down. And I don't know that I could have done that individually. You know, I think sometimes when I was swimming internationally, not that I didn't want to swim well for the U.S., I did, but there's definitely a more individual aspect to it. And it's more about, in some ways, what I wanted. I didn't have that do or die, I'm not going to let my team down attitude in the same way. Yeah. What about for, for younger kids that are listening to this and, and people that want to aspire to kind of have the type of success you had in college and then kind of internationally as well? You know, what, what's the key for them, you think, in, in terms of um, having success, you know, continued success, consistent success? What are some takeaways for them? I mean, honestly, working hard is going to always be something, but, but recognizing that you're not always going to like everything that you have to do. Mm. Um, I can first and foremost say that my entire career, I was told that I would magically become a morning person and I would adapt to morning practices. And unfortunately that never happened. And I don't believe it does happen. Um, so I can say that I did morning practices for 15 years and hated every minute of it. But I always understood that that's what I needed to do. It was a part of the process, and I knew that it would make me better. It's it's like doing 10 200s butterfly. You're never going to like doing that either. It's pretty miserable, but it makes you tougher. And it, it 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 those are the kind of sets that make you stand on the block and go, yeah, I am tougher than the people around me, and I'm going to beat you because of that. Because when I go into the that <laughs> the well of pain, it doesn't scare me, and I know I know how to push through that. And so. Some of it, I think, is is recognizing that and recognizing that it's it's not all roses and and joy, um, but also you do have to have fun. You have to love it. And and I had a couple plateaus in my career where I wasn't swimming well, you know. And at the end of the day, when I would get out of those plateaus, it was finding that little kid again, figuring out what I liked about swimming, what I liked about the water, why was I doing this, and and ultimately. You know, I, I had a club coach that used to say a happy Margaret is a fast Margaret. And and that was something that ultimately David <laughs> learned to say about me as well. And it was really the truth. Like when I was happy and I was having fun and I was laughing with my teammates, that's when I swam my best. And so, you know, it, it is truly having fun, but also recognizing that you got to take the good and the bad and they come together and working hard and, and just kind of all of that. What about the international side of swimming? Because you had success internationally as well, like, you know, a, a lot of success. So how how did you go from that mindset of like team to individual and back and forward to, to be able to have that success long course internationally as well? Yeah. Um, well, I would definitely say I'm a long course swimmer. Um, <laughs> first and foremost you know my strength is i'm i'm very powerful and so long course came a little bit easier to me than short course um so first of all that helped 
And, and I love traveling. I really love traveling. And so I just thought getting to go to all these international places was like the coolest thing in the world. So sometimes, again, the things that you get excited by, they don't have to necessarily be related to swimming or to the water. It can be about the fact that you're getting to travel all over the world. Um, and that was actually something that David understood about me. And so um, there, you know, there would be World Cup meets during the season. And traditionally, he didn't like to let athletes go because they would miss training or whatever. And he was always really good about letting me go to these World Cup meets in like November, December, because he realized that that was sort of a mental refresher for me. And I would come back and I would just be like so stoked about life and swimming and everything. And so, you know, whatever training I had missed it was was replaced by just the sheer joy I had for the sport. So I think that helped a lot. But but also I, I, I just I don't know. I was always impressed by it. I would I would I love going to swim meets and seeing the pool like dressed up for lack of a better word. You know, like you could walk into the Auburn pool every day for practice and it looks nice. But then when you walk into the Auburn pool for the U.S. Open or for Nationals or for the NCAA champions and, and it's got like all the fixings, like it looks really neat and it looks different. And so, I mean, I still love that feeling. Like even as an athlete, I'm not an athlete anymore, but if I walk into a pool now and it's like gussied up, I'm like, ooh, like it's time, you know? <laughs> and so I, that was my favorite. That was my favorite feeling like that, that just that high elite level, like it's go time. It's ready to race. And whether it was NCAAs or internationally, like that, that, that was why I swim. I just loved racing. Now, uh, Beijing was a uh, successful for you, a big, big meet. So you get yep. the silver in the 200 back, you get the bronze in the 100 back, and then you guys get silver in the 4 by one But in terms of the, the 200 back, who ended up winning the 200 back? Uh, Kirstie Coventry did. So, okay, there we go. So. Yep. So your teammate, your, the person that you come into on with as a, as a freshman, yeah. you guys go head to head at the Olympic Games. She wins gold, you win silver. Like what? What was that race like? How's that knowing that one of your best friends is the one that you got to compete for the gold against? Oh, it was great. Well, and, and the year before at the World Championships, I had won and she got second. So I mean, we had this history of just back and forth, back and forth. Mm. Um, and 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 that. Honestly, like I loved that relationship, and I'm glad that I had that that rivalry. Rivalry, <laughs> wow, uh, with somebody because we pushed each other. I mean, we would push each other in training, but also like I always knew that Kirsty was going to bring it. Like there was never a setting where I would go to a meet and I'm like, oh, she's going to slack off, and like maybe it'll be easy. <laughs> like no, like I always knew that like if I was going to win, like I had to be at my best. Period. End of story. And. And I, I imagine she felt the same way about me. I hope she felt the same way about me. Um, but I think because I 100% I knew that about her, that elevated me to a higher level because I, I knew that I couldn't slack off, be it in practice or when I was racing. And, you know, and there's also just familiarity there, right? You know, like I truly was happy for her. Like, yes, I wanted to win. But at the same time, like when you're standing on the podium, like, who better to be happy for than somebody you're friends with? And so it really was kind of this, this cool relationship where we pushed each other. But when the race was over, we both were genuinely happy for the other one because at the same time, I had still gone my best time. You know what I mean? And, and she had still gone her best time and that kind of thing. So I really think that we were happy for each other, but we both pushed each other to continually get better. I know at that stage, Kim was her primary coach. Was Kim yours or was it David or who was yours? At I was always David. So okay. for whatever reason, early on, they kind of divided and conquered with us. Like David mm. took me freshman year. Kim took took um, Kirsty freshman year. And so we we would train together, but we also always had our kind of individual coaches. Right. Okay. That's interesting. So, so you know, before the final, you're going to go talk to David. She's going to go talk to Kim. Did... Was there any, did it feel like a division at that point? Or like, was it weird? Like, I'm sure it's difficult, right? But like, was there any weirdness? I don't think so. Um, I mean, honestly, when we were at Auburn, like one of the things I liked was that there were always six coaches. You know, you had your, your four primary coaches, but then there were always like two grad assistants and mm -hmm. different people connected with different people. You know, um, Bill Pilzik, for example, was a grad assistant my freshman year. And a lot of the sprinters would connect with Bill. <laughs> which makes sense because Bill is a sprinter. And so, you know, David was just my person and that's who I went to. And so I don't, I don't think the coaches took that personally because they all had <laughs> plenty of athletes that they worked with. 
And so that just kind of was who I talked to. And that was what the relationship was. And Kirsty had the same thing. And I think they understood that, you know, some of it was personality driven and sometimes it was stroke driven or event driven. But I think it was just, again, going back to that, that bigger goal, they wanted the best for the team and or you individually in your career. And, you know, whoever, whatever was going to get that done, I think they were okay with that. Yeah. Okay. Introducing our newest sponsor, Swim Tracks. Swim Tracks is the smartest swim specific tracker ever. It registers a ton of swim data that is translated into valuable real time insights. It tracks the three most important data points for coaches and swimmers time, heart rate, and stroke rate. You and your swimmers can now, from just one device, make sure you're training in the correct energy zones with the correct number of strokes. Visit swimtracks.com and schedule your free demo today. That's swimtracks, T R A X X.com, swimtracks.com. Well, that, I mean, that's your, uh, that's, that's your career and that's your success in that sense. I, I don't know everything about you. I, I know I've, I've read some stuff and heard some stuff and I know that you're, you're active in, in other areas, but like, I know you had some struggles in your personal life as well and some things that were going on there. Do you want to um, share any of that right now? Yeah. Um, so I was sexually abused and I went public with that information after the 2008 Olympics. And at the time, truly thought it was just going to be like this one time revelation and then it was going to be done. I didn't know that there could like be a career after that. Um, and then actually at the time I had an agent and my agent started getting calls from organizations saying, Hey, will she come speak at our event and, mm. and whatnot. And so I, I ended up becoming a speaker and I've, I've been a speaker on this topic since 2008. So kind of cool change of course, didn't realize that that even was an option. Um, but yeah, so I'm a public speaker on sexual abu abuse. I also do some motivational speaking and, and, you know, talk about swimming and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a really I guess, cool career path. It's something I really love doing and I, I feel like I'm making a difference. I hope I'm making a difference. Well, you pro you are, I'm sure. I mean, if you've, if you've been doing this for a long time now and, and traveling around and talking, so what, what do you try and do then? Like, how do you try and make a difference? And what do people say to you in terms of when, when you present? What are you presenting? Yeah, so I'm really just telling my story. So I work with a lot of child advocacy centers and or rape crisis clinics. And mm. typically what those are is, a child advocacy center is where you send your kid, um, 18 and under. If you're, it's a rape crisis clinic, usually it's adults, so over 18. Um, but those are the places you go to when your kid has been abused in some form or fashion. Um, it, it doesn't have to be sexual abuse. It can be physical abuse. Um, they encompass that as well. But yeah, those are the organizations that effectively are, are dealing with this. Some of these organizations also do preventative work, um, but they're mostly doing the back end work. And so... I went to an advocacy center when I was a kid. And so that's kind of how I knew they existed. Um, and so I reached out to them and kind of in 2008 and said, I want to help. I don't know what I can do. How do I figure this out? And so originally that was kind of how the speaking also, I got tied in with them. And then um, I really, I, I speak, I would say 50% at fundraisers, 50% at conferences um, with people in the field. And it's really just telling my story. It's telling my story of what happened to me, but, but more importantly, I think overcoming it and what that process looked like. Cause at the end of the day, what happened to me doesn't matter. And I, and I mean that in a positive way. I mean, other than just, you know, morbid curiosity, what happened happened, but it's, it's how do we overcome these things and how do we move on with our life? How do we find success, you know, and, and become happy people. And so it's focusing, I think on that. And it's been really rewarding. Um, I can sincerely say I have never done a speech ever where I haven't had somebody disclose to me and tell me their, about their own abuse. Um, I typically have several people disclose to me at, at any given event. And, you know, I, I take that really seriously. Like it's, it's such an honor to me when people feel comfortable enough to tell me their story. And, and it doesn't mean that that's the first time that they're, they're telling anybody, although I have had that happen. Um, I think anytime anyone feels comfortable enough to, to tell something that personal and that dramatic, you know, I, I always, I'm always very honored by that. So yeah, so it's, it's been a cool experience. And, and like I said, sometimes it's, it's educating people out there that just don't know about the subject, but also sometimes it's working with other professionals in the field and 
hopefully giving them some tips and some insights on how they can do better in their job. But I think also just letting them know that their job is so important and that they are doing an amazing job. Margaret, what age did this happen, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, not at all. I was five to seven, so I was little. Wow, five to seven. So you, you used the word um, prevention early on. Like, as a five-year-old, this, this isn't really preventable at that age, is it? Um, yes and no. So I, I think the prevention, because I help with prevention now, is – oh, sorry, my cat's, like, trying to knock things off the table <laughs> – um, it's it's more for the adults. So it's not necessarily that you're going to prevent the five-year-old from getting in scenarios, but it's educating the adults around that child that hopefully they see some of the signs and maybe right. catch it. Right. Um, there are things you can tell small children, and obviously you want to educate kids. And and I, I was really lucky. I actually had sexual abuse education in school. Um, it was in fifth grade. I don't remember how old you are in fifth grade. Um, but we did have it, and and that's actually what prompted my disclosure. I ended up telling my 11-year-old best friend. Oh, so 11. I guess that's what, how old you are. So uh, my 11-year-old best friend at the time. Um, so that education did matter. But, yeah, I think when you're really, really little, the education component is is talking to kids, telling them that you don't have secrets, telling them that nobody's allowed to touch, you know, their private parts, what's covered by a bathing suit, you know, things like that. Um but I think the secret thing is, is a big thing. You know, I try to talk to people about the difference between like a surprise and a secret. Like, hey, we're going to have a surprise party for mom or dad. But that's not something we're telling them now, but they're going to find out. Right. It's not a secret you're keeping from them forever versus saying don't ever tell them this. And so I think just starting those conversations at a young age. But a lot of it is honestly kind of on the adult on the adults and kind of what to look for. So I haven't talked about this publicly, but I, I have a brother who was sexually abused. So I, I went to a, uh, a Catholic boys school and, and my brother followed me a couple of years later. He's, he's two years younger than me. Um, and I found out just recently within the last 12 months that he was sexually abused from uh, the age of uh, 13 and 14, actually, oh. at, at, at the school by a priest. And... Um, and that's going through uh, the courts right now. And, and but, but my brother ended up becoming a drug addict and, and going to prison. He's in prison right now. He's been a drug, drug addict for 20 years. He's in prison. So how how did that not happen to you? So like, like obviously there's two paths with any. Yeah. Like when abuse happens, I, I imagine it's extremely traumatic. And when I when I've talked to the people surrounding my brother in this whole this whole saga they say it's it's almost a hundred percent certain that the person's going to end up on drugs they're going to you know try and harm themselves they're going to do certain things they're going to go in this path so yeah. how was it that you directed into that path and became <laughs> an olympic medalist like yeah yeah a completely different way with it yeah well first of all i'm i'm obviously sorry that happened to your brother and, and your family um but yeah i mean it, the path that he took, unfortunately, is very, very common. And it's interesting because I think something that I have realized that I've been talking about, and I think there's a lot more people like me than, than people realize, but it's harder to diagnose because I think when people act out and do negative things, you see that and then you sit right. there and go, oh, why is this person doing this? Right. For me, what I did was I... I didn't feel good about myself either, but I always had, I call it like the pit of despair. So mm -hmm. I had this bucket and I just kept throwing accomplishment after accomplishment after accomplishment into this bucket because mm -hmm. I didn't feel that I had value. And so I, you know, I look at athletes here, like normal people here. And sometimes athletes kind of want to be here because they like to feel like they're better than people. Well, I was like way down here somewhere. And so I, I had to be an Olympian just to feel normal, like mm -hmm. just to walk into the room like a normal person would. And I didn't realize that for a really, really long time because I, I was a perfectionist in everything. Like I had like a 4.0 in school and in addition to the swimming things and, and I was good at most sports when I was younger. And so it was that was why it was it was this this need to feel better about myself. And once I realized that, I mean, yes, I'm also naturally competitive. So I don't I don't want to say that there wasn't an element to me already being an athlete and competing. But once I realized that in a lot of ways, what was motivating me really wasn't healthy, it, it was a shift. It was really hard to kind of shift and, and figure out how to 
motivate myself from a healthy place. And it's been interesting because I talk about that in a lot of my speeches, because I think sometimes the kids that are the perfectionists, again, nobody sits there and wonders why. Nobody goes, well, why is this kid making good grades? Because those are generally accepted things. And it's like I said, it's been interesting because a lot of people at my speeches have come up to me and been like, oh my gosh, like I just had this light bulb moment, you know, like I was abused and I'm the first person in my family to go to college or to get a master's degree or to do X, Y, or Z. And they're doing it for the same reasons. They're doing it because they didn't feel good about themselves either. And so I think there are a lot of us out there that are achieving great mm. things, whatever those things are, you know, mm. because we don't necessarily feel good about ourselves, but you can't, you know, you can't, I don't know, measure those because, or they're not being measured because they're harder to find. Um, so I, in a lot of ways, equally destructive, but destructive, I think in a different way, if that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Incredible. Yeah. I just, I, I can relate to that in that sense, you know, like, cause I, I even, um, carried around this guilt of like being the older brother and not, not defending him and, uh, not, not not defending him, but not being able to help this kid. You know, like my brother became a drug addict at 16 and I felt a lot of guilt of like, well, that was my fault. Like I wasn't there for enough. I didn't help him through this. I wasn't supportive enough and or I didn't help him out of it. Like I I struggled with my brother for years to try and pull him out of this, uh, you know. Did you have that on the opposite side where you had people in your family like like Margaret, stop, this is gonna kill you. You don't have to be this good, you know, like like stop trying to be, you know, this Olympic champion. Um, yes and no. Yeah. Um, so with the sexual abuse specifically, I know my mom took that really, really hard. I mean, she felt guilty for years, still does, that she just when did didn't you find out about that. Like when did you um, so I told my parents when I was 11. So I didn't tell anybody from seven to 11. And then 11 was when I disclosed to my friend and then ultimately my parents. So did your parents believe you straight away? A hundred percent. And I was, that's very rare. Yeah. Um, and I was very, very lucky, but my mom immediately believed me and I, I was able to get help right away. So mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of my success was the fact that I was believed and that I got help so quickly. But I know that was hard on my mom and, and, and on any parent. I think any parent when they, especially the ones that aren't the abusers, <laughs> believe their kids, when they feel like when they don't see it. And, and again, like historically, that education hasn't been there. So I don't blame my mom at all. I'm like, of course, how would you know? You know, like, it's not like you're a bad parent. Of course you're not. You it's just you didn't know. And I think I think when you're not a devious person your brain doesn't automatically go to devious things, right? right? Because that's nothing my mother would ever have done. So why in the world is she going to think of that when she, you know, is presented with maybe something that looks slightly off, you know, she's going to come up with a more innocent, realistic scenario of what could have happened. So there is that. Um, but also I would say with swimming, there there were definitely times when I, I think I would take it to an extreme. So you know, I'm a bigger person and, and my weight was always an issue when I was swimming. And, and I think we know a lot more about body types and about weight now. Um, but at the time there was less information. And so, you know, my coaches wanted the best for me and, and they wanted me to be as fit as I could be because they wanted, they saw my potential and they wanted me to be a good athlete. But there, I think was an extremeness that I took it to. And so my, my family would see that and they would be like, you know, don't talk so negatively about yourself. And mm -hmm. why, why can you not see how fit you are? Why can you not see the accomplishments you've had? Um, so I actually, I actually really struggled with making the 2004 Olympic team um, emotionally because I had a horrible race, like absolutely horrible. I was like two seconds off my best time. And I didn't feel like I deserved to be on the Olympic team because I was watching multiple friends of mine get third do the swim out of their minds, do their best time and not make this team. And then here I was, I swim horribly and I make the team and I'm, I'm first. So I'm, you know, the fastest American. And I just, I just was embarrassed. Like I did not feel like I deserved to be there. And, and my family couldn't understand that. They were like, what are you talking about? Like you made an Olympic team. And, and I remember my mom and my sister at one point, like a year later, like sitting me down and they were like, stop, like <laughs> you need to get your act together because this is not normal. Like you need to be proud of yourself 
it doesn't matter that you feel like you didn't do your best because you were the best that the U.S. had to offer in that moment. And and so sometimes I think I, I did need that, but also I, I think having that outside perspective of other people because you can get really in your head and really hard on yourself. And I think now that I've I've been removed from swimming for 12 years, like I can look back and see some of those things that at the time I couldn't see. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah, maybe that was an extreme reaction, but it was very real at the time. Mm, yeah, I was going to say that. I mean, how do you feel about your career now? I mean, looking back, you must be so extremely proud. I mean, uh, to win three national titles, pe people generally don't get that kind of luck to be on a team where you can win those types of national championships and then go on and, and win medals at the Olympics. It must be super proud for you, knowing that, that kind of it could have gone the other way. I mean, 98% 90, of the people that went through what you went through at a young age do end up on drugs. So you're you're even yeah. <laughs> the rare the rare, you know what I mean? So yeah, right. it's gotta be a little proud pride, right? Oh, a hundred percent. And it's it's actually really funny because um I, I've I've had this happen recently, but you know, I, I have a lot of friends now that are not in the swimming world. And you know, I met some new friends fairly recently and you know, they find out that I'm a swimmer and about my career or whatever. And, and I'll always say like, oh, well, you know, I, I had a world record. And they're like, that's so impressive. And I'm like, oh, well, I mean, I only had it for a month. And they're like, so? <laughs> like, it doesn't matter. You need to stop downplaying it. And so yeah. it's funny because in my head, I always do that. I'm always like, oh, well, I just had it for a month. Like, it's yeah. not that big a deal. Like, it is a big deal. But it's it's sometimes having those other people in your life to give you perspective. Because I think when you live in that world and when you know so many world record holders or Olympians or whatever, yeah. it, you get it, but you don't get it. And I think the further and further removed I am from swimming, the more I understand it and the more I am proud of myself. Not that I haven't always been proud of myself, but I think I'm becoming more and more proud of myself because I'm starting to get it. And I'm starting to 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 see what other people see that I, I wasn't always able to see. Yeah. Yeah, Margaret, I was a really good swimmer, one of the best in the world, and I didn't come anywhere near a world record. So, <laughs> yeah, you should be really proud of us, damn it. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's cool. Well, listen, I appreciate you sharing today. This is this is um, cool. Like in terms of how you got to be successful in the pool and the work that you did, and then how you and the stuff you overcame, and then just sharing that aspect of it. There are going to be people that listen to this and and can relate to to both sides of it you know yeah. and um and then there's going to be people that listen to this and and will never be able to do the work that you did you know like it's just this it it takes a lot of dedication and a lot of sacrifice and um you know uh, to do what you did is is very rare so like thank you for sharing today i appreciate that it's nice to get Absolutely. to hear your story from you as well um yeah, what's next in the future? Like, what have you got coming up in the future? Oh, goodness. Um, well, I am. I I wrote a book actually during COVID. Oh. Um, and so I am in the process of starting to figure out what now do I do with it. So um, I'm I'm hoping to find an editor, get that published, get that out to the world. So that's something that's on my my radar. Um, <laughs> no timeline, but hopefully in the near future. Um, and then really just speaking, you know, speaking has always kind of been um, my passion and and someday I would like to have a foundation. So I'm, I'm starting to look into how to do that and what that looks like and, and whatnot. But yeah, so some of what I've been doing, some a little bit new, you know, but just. Well, listen, I mean, good for you. Again, you're writing a book. I mean, what a high achiever, damn it. You know, like. Um... <laughs> Uh, look, honestly, my brother put my my parents through so much pain. I can't even describe it. And 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 even to the extent of maybe part of me moving to America was was the pain that my brother put us through, and and the way he dealt with it. So like, look, the way that you've gone about this and dealt with your pain and 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 your uh, you know the, the the embarrassment of what you had to go through and the way that you've dealt with it is so different to my brother. So you know, like again, like you should be so proud of yourself in 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 the way that you've chosen to handle this. Um, you know, I just, I did this, uh, I, I was chatting with this guy the other day, uh, randomly who, who, uh, he's from, from Africa and he got a scholarship to run in college a, in Alaska. So he's from Africa and he gets this scholarship to run in Alaska. He goes out one night. <laughs> I 
he goes out one night for a run and um, long story short, he disappears. 56 hours later, they find him on the side of the road. He's got frostbite and uh, they have to take his feet. And so they, they basically amputate his feet. This guy's a runner from Africa. Oh. And so taking your feet is everything. He wakes up and the first thought that he has is, wow, I'm still alive. Not the fact that he's lost his feet. It's like he's alive, that he's been given the gift of life. Yeah. And so he, in his mindset is like, I'm not looking at this as what I lost. I'm looking at this as what I've gained, you know? And in a way, in some crazy way, you kind of took a very similar approach of like, yeah, this could have destroyed me if I wanted yeah. it to, or it could have shot me into excellence. And that's a very rare choice. And so, um, yeah, Margaret, you should be super proud of that. That's pretty cool. You know, it's well, a... You took the you took the harder road, I think. The easy road is to say, I'm gonna I'm gonna let this destroy my life and everybody else around me. You know what I mean? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, it's it's interesting you say that because I I'm very particular about using the word survivor. Um, I think that mm -hmm. word gets thrown around a lot and people just slap it on people. And I'm like, no, 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 you're not a survivor by definition because this happens to you. You're a survivor because you choose to be. And, and part of that is that decision, right? It's that decision to say, I'm not going to let this define me. I'm not going to let this be the end of my life. And, right. you know, that, that doesn't mean that you have to reach ultimate healing, whatever that is. It just simply means that you're, you're, you're saying, I'm not going to let whatever this negative thing is define yeah. me and I'm, I'm going to fight back. And so I, I think, I think it has to be an individual choice for somebody to decide. And then it doesn't have to be sexual abuse, right? It could be cancer, you know, whatever the, the horrible thing is, but it's, it's ultimately saying that I am going to move on and then, you know, there's, there's going to be better. And I mean, I guess you don't have to, but for me, I'm like, you have to, right? Like, because yeah. I don't know, I, I want to be happy. I want to have a, a, a happy life. And, and that's, I guess, how I view how you do it. <laughs> Yeah. Margaret, if people want you to come and talk to a particular group or whatever, how do they contact you? Um, I am on all of the social medias, um, but also probably my website is the easiest. Um, the hardest part of that is going to be spelling my last name correctly. <laughs> so, it's on, the, uh, it's on, the it's on there. That's why I put it on there. So yeah, so my, my website is literally just margaretholzer.com. Um, but also any of the social medias, if people reach out to me, I'll, yeah. I'll shoot them my email and, and help them connect yeah. as well. We'll, uh, we'll put links on this on, on, on our YouTube. We'll make sure that we link, um, your, your, you know, everything that you've got, we'll link it up. So, um, that's cool. The other quick thing I want to say is you've just joined any question, you know, that I work uh, full time for any question and you've joined on as an expert in swimming and listen, you've got so much great stuff to talk about. Um, in terms of sharing your journey, sharing technical advice. I mean, one of the best swimming minds out there. So uh, certainly get on any question, look up Margaret Holzer and, and start asking her questions because she's already on there doing a fantastic job. So check that out, everybody. All right. Um, Margaret, thanks again. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. This was awesome. It was great to catch up. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been too long. So um, yeah, good to see you again. And uh, yeah, stay in touch, right? Absolutely. War Eagle. All right. War Eagle, bye. Destro Swim Towers. Gain strength in the water with a tower of power. Save $150 per double swim tower by using code BRETT, B-R-E-T-T, -T, at checkout. DestroMachines.com.